Farming isn't always a straightforward business in Australia. Enter Cherax quadricarinatus, the red claw crayfish, an Australian farmer's best friend. This freshwater creature is being placed strategically in farms around Australia for two reasons, to boost crop yield and maximize space. Large areas of Australia are still affected by dryland salinity, and that's a telltale sign that the continent is quite old. We're talking millions of years without any major changes. What about other places on Earth? Well, most continents have completely turned upside down in that time, thanks to several ice ages and earthquakes. But Australia has just barely changed, and in all that time, massive salt deposits have been building up underground. Now that they are slowly rising to the surface, it's a problem for farmers across the nation. To make matters worse, human activity seems to be accelerating the soil salination process. When European settlers arrived in the 19th and 20th centuries, they cleared deep-rooted native plants that once held the groundwater in place and replaced them with shallow-rooted crops. As a result, these crops couldn't stop the salty groundwater from rising, so when the water table climbed, it brought buried salts to the surface, damaging the soil. On top of that, poor water management only sped things up. Without proper control, more salt pushed through the top layer. The result? Salt-filled topsoil began choking out crops and left the land struggling to stay productive. In Australia, dryland salinity affects more than 2 million hectares of otherwise productive farmlands in Western Australia alone. This salinity problem is hitting Western Australia hard, affecting about 8% of the state's farmland, turning large areas into land that can barely grow anything. About 320 to 360,000 metric tons of rice was consumed by Australia in 2023. Most of it is supplied by domestic production, meeting only 60% of its rice needs. So what does one do when you have such terrible soil but need to feed a population of 27 million Australians? Well, rice farmers in Australia seem to have found the answer. Crayfish aquaculture. Yes, Australian farmers are taking freshwater crayfish and putting them in rice fields to help solve their soil productivity issues. Don't be mistaken, crayfish are not fertilizers for poor soil, but they do contribute to soil health in several ways. The hero of today's story is Cherax quadricarinatus, a freshwater crustacean native to tropical parts of Australia. You might know it better as the Red Claw Crayfish. It gets its name from the bold red stripe on the outer edge of the male's claws. Originally found in slow-moving rivers, lagoons, and farm dams, how can this creature survive in fields when removed from fresh water? Now, rice fields aren't like your average crop fields. These paddies are usually flooded with fresh water, which just so happens to mimic the natural habitat of the red claw crayfish. Red Claw crayfish are known for their hardy nature and fast growth. They can grow up to 35 centimeters long and weigh as much as 600 grams at harvest. Considering how little is needed to raise a Red Claw crayfish, you can get a pound of clean, high-quality meat from this creature with ease. But it's not their meat that interests many Australian farmers. These little ecosystem engineers, as they are often referred to, play different roles in land restoration through aquaculture. Farmers grow red claw fish in earthen ponds on degraded or salt-affected land. They feed on leftover crops and bio-waste. When they excrete, it mixes with decaying plants and forms a nutrient-rich sludge. The organic residues left by crayfish activity support soil microorganisms that naturally recycle key nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, enhancing fertility over time. Farmers then scoop up the sediments when they drain the pond and spread it across fields. This immediately improves the soil structure by increasing microbial activities which restore fertility. It's not just the sludge. Crayfish in the fields are burrowed. They dig little hideouts in the mud to stay cool, moist, and safe from predators. These tunnels also help oxygen reach the roots of rice plants, supporting soil health and plant growth. They also eat up decayed plants, algae, and leftover rice husks in the process. According to agricultural studies, crayfish activity may boost soil permeability by up to 18%, making it easier for rice roots to access oxygen and nutrients. 
Not only do these actions allow more air to pass through, it also lets fresh water penetrate through these burrows and reduce surface evaporation. In arid environments like much of Australia, even minor improvements in water absorption can make a big difference. Crayfish burrowing reduces runoff and helps retain moisture where it's most needed near the roots. In the long run, it even makes water use more efficient. You can say that they are basically nature's cleanup crew, making the water cleaner and taking out weeds for the rice farmer. As a result, the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries and several university-led programs are exploring sustainable aquaculture models involving red claw crayfish in ponds and integrated systems. But Cherax quadricarinatus isn't just picked up and thrown into rice paddies. They wouldn't be able to achieve the desired results that way. First of all, timing matters a lot in this situation. Some farmers run a simultaneous system where the rice and crayfish are grown together, which means the crayfish is introduced after the rice has been transplanted. Others use a rotational system where the rice is harvested first and then crayfish are introduced in the off-season. A lot of preparation goes on before adding these creatures into the fields. First, farmers prepare the rice fields by digging trenches or refuge pits around the edges of the rice field. Crayfish need these trenches as they provide a cool, moist place to hide. Predators and harsh, sunny weather are far from optimal for these creatures. The field must also be leveled and surrounded by low embankments that stop the water from escaping the field. Interestingly, crayfish thrive in pH levels between 6.5 and 8.0. Thus, farmers must check to make sure that water is slightly saline and rich in minerals. Pesticides are not introduced to these fields either. Although Cherax quadricarinatus is a very resilient creature, pesticides can affect the reproductive abilities of these creatures and even cause death in certain instances. Besides, these creatures already help you eat up pests in the fields, so technically, they serve as biological predators to some pest species. Once the field is prepared, these creatures can now be transported to the well-prepared fields. Hatcheries across the country sell fingerlings or juveniles, young crayfish that are released into the flooded rice field. How many fingerlings can be put in a rice paddy? Farmers typically introduce two to four crayfish per square meter, depending on the water quality and system design. Cherex quadricarinatus, the red clay crawfish, barely needs a special feeding technique or a meal to survive. They feed on a wide variety of things, from organic debris to algae, weeds, and other animals found in their environment. However, farmers can supplement feeding by introducing duckweed or commercial pellets. Even rice bran, a byproduct of rice milling, will do to keep these aquatic creatures alive. Besides feeding, they're also low maintenance, mostly requiring keeping the water clean so they stay clean as well. Crayfish introduced to the rice fields in this way will thrive and soon rapidly multiply. In a controlled environment, a healthy female can produce 300 to 1,000 eggs per clutch and breed two to three times a year. Of course, these reproductive rates are dependent on factors like water temperature, diet, and overall field conditions. That puts the potential number of juveniles produced from just a few breed pairs at 2,000 plus. That begs the question, how much damage can crayfish cause to rice if their population gets out of control? In one study, scientists found that increasing crayfish size results in larger negative effects on rice plants. They found that in large populations, instead of increasing the yield, the crayfish fed on the rice seedlings and their excessive burrowing led to imbalances in soil aeration and irrigation. But not to panic, one way to make sure that doesn't happen is by introducing crayfish to rice fields only when rice plants have reached a sufficient size and developed strong stems. It is important to consider rice varieties that are robust so that the crops are not affected by crayfish movement. Making annular ditches in the field is one way that Chinese farmers protect their rice paddies. During the rice season, crayfish can retreat into these ditches, keeping them away from the rice roots by providing shelter and minimizing crop disturbance. One proactive measure is to feed the crayfish with supplements to stop them from feasting on the rice plants, especially in times of scarcity. The economic data on the rice crayfish aquaculture are quite compelling. Implementing the rice crayfish combination has been seen to be a hundred times more effective. The Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO, has reported an increase of 9.5% in rice yield when rice crayfish systems are used instead of monoculture rice farming. In fact, rice crayfish co-culture yields 1.12 to 2.21 times 
more nutrition per hectare compared to rice monoculture. According to Chinese studies, this figure translates to about $6,500 in more profit per hectare annually, showing that the nutrient output from rice crayfish co-culture systems is more profitable compared to rice alone. These benefits are hard to ignore, and as a result, the scale of adoption is gradually climbing. Farmers in the Sihu Lake Basin have seen significant adoption, with rice crayfish fields increasing by 60% in the region between 2016 to 2020. That doesn't mean that you can replicate the same results with just any crayfish. The Murray crayfish is another popular species and is considered the second largest freshwater crayfish species after the Tasmanian giant freshwater crayfish. You know what they say about Australia and its ginormous creatures. They can grow up to 50 centimeters in length and weigh up to 2 kilograms. Despite their size, introducing this species into rice paddies has its limitations. For one, Murray crayfish are stream and river specialists that prefer cool, flowing water. That means they definitely wouldn't thrive in rice paddies where they'd reproduce very slowly and reach sexual maturity even slower. As a result, the most suitable crustaceans for rice crayfish co-culture are the red claw crayfish, which we're already familiar with, and the similar Yabby's Cherex destructor as native crayfish species. It hasn't always been this way, though. The earliest incidents of animals being introduced to rice fields started in ancient China. Farmers used this farming system to improve rice and keep pests at bay. Fish were introduced to eat pests that damaged plants. Meanwhile, the pests served as food for the fish, and in turn, the waste from the fish served as fertilizer for the rice. The rice fields also doubled as shelter for the fish, making it the ultimate cheat code. Ancient Chinese farmers also built sophisticated water management systems, which they controlled with precision. They understood the fish life cycle and essentially passed it down for generations. Even for their time, they were already running a complicated, optimized system that did something different in agriculture. But it wasn't until the 1980s that China switched up the entire system. This period came with economic reforms that changed how Chinese farmers did business, switching from collective operations to family-oriented business. This led to a rapid progress of innovation. But the farmers didn't just stop at fish. They started experimenting with everything from crabs to turtles, ducks, and even catfish. Next thing, they had an entire ecosystem of integrated farming. China has since become a big player in the production of crayfish, with an annual output that makes up for 90% of global production. This is despite the fact that crayfish isn't native to China. But you know what is native to China? Rice. China is well known for its expansive rice fields, utilizing rice fields in the way that allowed for this type of boom. The rice crayfish co-culture is such an efficient agricultural model that both grain and aquatic products are boosted simultaneously. Thus, by taking a leaf from China's agricultural success with co-culturing of rice with other plants, they can do more with less. Australia is similar to China in the sense that rice is not native to Australia. Also working against the country's odds is that the soil salinity makes it almost impossible to grow crops, especially water-intensive crops like rice. In fact, Australia's first serious attempt at rice cultivation happened in the early 20th century when Jo Takasuka planted rice near Naya on the Murray River. Red Claw crayfish was largely unknown to the rest of the world until the late 1980s when it became such a prospect for aquaculture. Red Claw farming activity picked up very quickly, and by early 2015, the Queensland Crayfish Farmers Association was promoting the benefits of Red Claw farming and even published an article in that respect. With both industries established, it became possible for Australian farmers to experiment with rice crayfish integration. Despite the fact that rice crayfish farming is gaining traction, most aquaculture ventures are small-scale pilot projects, not large-scale adoptions as seen in China. However, China has proved that in fact rice crayfish systems work and consistently improve key soil properties. Organic soil carbon nearly doubled in these projects, and soil moisture increased by 30%. Same with soil porosity at 9%, while bulk density increased. Even microbial community analysis shows that this method encourages good bacteria that help recycle carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus as a natural way to fertilize the soil. In other words, it's much easier to treat such rice fields without the fear of antibiotic resistance. 
Beyond yield and soil health, rice crayfish systems also contribute to climate resilience. Wetland-style rice fields have a natural ability to store carbon in flooded soils, and when managed with reduced chemical inputs, these systems can lower greenhouse gas emissions like nitrous oxide. The presence of crayfish also reduces the need for synthetic fertilizers, which are major contributors to emissions during production. Additionally, integrated farming improves biodiversity. Rice paddies with crayfish tend to support more beneficial insects, amphibians, and microorganisms, creating a more balanced and less pest-prone ecosystem. Studies from Southeast Asia have even shown that integrated rice aquatic animal systems enhance farmers' ability to adapt to erratic weather patterns caused by climate change. In this way, the rice crayfish model isn't just a solution for productivity, it's a path towards sustainable, low-impact agriculture. Pests and insects are a frequent nightmare for rice farmers, and traditional chemical treatments often damage the soil over time. Without a doubt, co-culture practices can improve rice cultivation and crayfish rearing to the point of making countries like Australia become big-time exporters without the crop or animal being native to the region. This isn't just an Australian solution, it could work in parts of Africa too, where salinity and drought are major issues. Australia's interest in adapting the Chinese-style rice crayfish system makes it a prime location for the next-level rice crayfish model. Even beyond red claw crayfish, there are other native species, like yabbies, that can be useful in rice crayfish cultivation. Already, Australian research organizations, both private and public, are showing initiative in closing the gap between Australia and notable China. Indigenous-led aquaculture projects like the Jackage Initiative are already showing how traditional knowledge and modern science can come together to revive wetland cultivation and produce a much better output for farmers. It doesn't just stop at making a lot more rice and crayfish through co-culture. The benefits of this system are social and economical, too. An innovation of this kind promises to create jobs, strengthen food security, and support rural and indigenous communities across Australia. So while moving millions of crayfish into rice fields might sound wild, it could just be the kind of innovation the future needs. One look at the big picture, and it's easy to see why. Climate change remains an imminent concern, and environmental collapse continues to contribute significantly, too. Feeding 8 billion people definitely starts with farming practices that preserve the natural environment and boost food production. Farmers can employ natural elements to fight off pest and disease, lowering the use of pesticides or heavy chemicals on food. Rice crayfish co-culture is proof that powerful solutions often come from understanding and mimicking natural systems. Do you think Australia is setting herself up to join the next farming revolution? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more videos like these.